Hello everyone, welcome back. Um, here's another video um, for Philosophy 115, Summer 2019, and this is a, an important one. Um, I'm actually going to make a note in the announcement where I, I post this about uh, the importance of what I'm about to talk about, because I'm going to make a little adjustment to how things are going to happen here in this last week. I just had this idea this morning and I was like, oh, why didn't I think of this before? I think this is going to serve your needs um, better than my original plan. Um, if you have any concerns about it, of course, let me know. But um, I'm excited to share this idea because I, th I think this is going to be a much better way of accommodating the last, um, the, the way I've alluded to before, how like the fast pace of summer sort of hits this brick wall at the end. And I'm sorry I'm not outside uh, in here instead of outside, but right when I was going to go out to record this video outside my apartment, there was this like, massive backhoe like chewing up the concrete in the school nearby so it's pretty noisy out there but I always love the outdoor scenery better than indoors anyway that doesn't matter what is this big idea that I've got well um, the original plan was for me to lecture today on our first sort of installment of sorry I got ambushed by a sneeze attack again um, the original plan was to start talking about the last unit of the quarter, the unit on informal fallacies. That was, I was going to lecture on that today. I was going to lecture on it next Tuesday and next Thursday, like the schedule that we've had for lectures going forward. And then I was like, and that really, it sucks because you're getting done with all the material on Thursday and then you've got to, you know, get ready and take exam three um, through the just a few days after that right there's not there's not as much of this buffer right like I have been having uh, where you've had more time to like kind of manage things at your own pace there's been this sharp wall of it and to have the lectures go like that is a little tight so I decided you know normally throughout this quarter I taught this class online before but I've been like, I want to make new lectures for you because I think I can improve on them and that I can like be responsive to the questions I'm hearing from you and how I get to know you over the course of the quarter and sort of anticipate where people are at a little bit better. Um, I always like being present here with you rather than just having like an entire canned class ready to go online. That's been uh, a value of mine in, in running this class. But I thought for this last unit to try to help you get more flexibility that you can like prepare better that you're not going to be rushed especially if you're managing other things in your schedule and life which I know you are uh, at least some of you um, I decided I, I think for this last unit I'm just going to post all of the video lectures I gave on the informal fallacies when I taught this class last time and just put all those up there today as soon as I get done recording this video I'm gonna set things up that way and make an announcement post um, so this whole last unit it's about the same amount of time uh, overall like six hours of lecture uh, it's probably a little less than that actually uh, these videos um, but they're all going to be up there and accessible to you today so if you wanted to uh, get through all this material this weekend if that's like what you need to do to prepare for next week then um, you you won't have to be uh, doing all that studying and preparing at the very end of next week right before finishing up things like makeup exams and exam three so I thought uh, and I know you're working on exam two this weekend too but um, you could get this stuff knocked out earlier in the week and, and just give yourself a little bit more flexibility. Um, so I wanted to give you that option and I think that's going to work a lot better. Um, there will be video codes like usual um, and I'll put them up there too. Um, you might find them that they're uh, weighted strangely like they're going to be weighed there's because there's it's split into four parts so I'm going to try to weight each part in accordance with like how much lecture time to make it equivalent to all these other lectures. Uh, so if you see some weird goofy things with how many points are being awarded for each of those codes, that's the reason why, um, just to make them commensurate with the time you've had to invest in watching all these other lecture videos. Um, so that's a note. Um, and if there is anything from those, uh, well, okay, so I'm still planning on doing some of the other usual stuff here. Like I want to do a... Uh, follow-up video on uh, answering questions from the 8, 9, 10 homework like I've done for the other other chapters. 
Um, right now there's only one question up there, and it's a, a little bit more of an esoteric question. Um, but I'm hoping that maybe we'll get some more posts on that discussion board so that I can make a video out of giving answers to your questions. Um, so I'm still waiting on that. Probably going to wait um, at least through tomorrow to see if anyone posts anything through Friday. And then um, I'm planning on using today's lecture as a little bit of a like overview of all the stuff that's related to exam two and a little exam two review. So I thought that open uh, open us up to be able to do that as well, and I think that might be valuable because there's a lot of material here for exam two. It's a, it's a loaded exam just like exam one. Um, there's a lot going on, but in some ways it's a little more of a challenge than in, in than in exam one. Um, because you have to do more of this kind of explaining work that I was talking about in the last lecture. So that's the game plan. Pretty much everything else that I said in that like master schedule um, for like all the things that are coming up, like due dates for exams, how the makeup exams are going to work, when exam three is going to hit, all that's going to stay the same. The only change I'm making right now is when the video lectures are available to you, and they're going to basically be all available now. Uh, you'll see me with an older haircut, and uh, maybe my I recorded those right after my son was born, so you'll maybe see a little infant Luke. Um, so don't get thrown off by that. I, I'm not sure it would throw you off, but that's why those videos are going to look the way that they are, is that they're the old recorded videos. But I thought I, I don't have the bandwidth for just doing all the recordings for that material right now for you. Um, because of all the stuff happening with my other class as well. Um, but I thought this could be a solution to give uh, to get that benefit of flexibility for you next week. If you got any questions about it, let me know. Um, but that's how I'm, I'm going to proceed here for this final unit. Um, so just as a quick recap of everything that's going on here, I think it's always useful to repeat this information. Um, you're going to have uh, exam two, two, which is due very soon here. In fact, um, here, let me bring up uh, whoop, modules here. This is our Canvas site. So we've got exam two due on the 12th. So that's coming up. Um, and then I, after that is done, I will be grading it, hopefully turning around uh, the grades here in, there we go, there's me. Um, turning around the grades in 24 hours if I can pull it off. I'm definitely going to be pushing for that so that you'll have maximum time here uh, to work on um, the makeup for exam two. You'll have a maximum window open available uh, if you want to do that. So I'm hoping exam 12 or uh, sorry August 12th is when you'll have all these entries done and then by the end of the 13th I'll have them all graded eh pretty close to that as much as I can and then um, uh, you'll have approximately four or five days here to be able to consider uh, taking the makeup exam so for exam two and makeup exam for exam one already open and available all the way through the 18th at midnight um, that's the very latest that I could put the deadlines for these um, to give you as much time as possible and then finally there will be uh, exam three here, exam three, and that will also be due on the 18th, um, and I will open this exam up next week, um, probably, hmm, probably on the 14th is when I'll make exam three available, um, and you'll have uh, homework due for the informal fallacies as well, again, it's just sort of a suggested deadline, uh, if you want to get it done earlier, that's great, later is going to be okay too. Um, just as long as you get this done before you take exam three, which is what highly recommended. Um, I also, in fact, um, have the, uh, I'm actually going to change this homework around a little bit. Um, so the homework problems for this unit on informal fallacies is, is taken from the textbook. But a couple quarters ago when I was teaching this class, I was like, you know what, I could do even better because they have all of the homework problems like broken up by units and it becomes a little easier to answer the questions and it doesn't pr it doesn't give you as much of a robust preparation for what exam three is going to be like where you're going to have to match all of these informal fallacies, these argumentative mistakes with these problems of like examples of people arguing and talking with each other where they're making, they're becoming guilty of making those mistakes and you have to match them up. 
but you're given like the entire pool of all the fallacies we're studying. We're studying 32 of them um, that you want to get familiar with these patterns. Um, so that's not going to be the best preparation. So I actually took all the homework problems and typed them all up out of the textbook and arranged them into the format of how this is going to look. So they're actually going to uh, appear like, um, here I can pull them up here, uh, they're going to look almost like practice exams um, for exam three. So here, let me pull up one of them here, Microsoft. Uh, there's the study guide. We're going to talk about that in a second. Mm -hmm. So here's all the problems. And I'm actually going to probably modify this document to give you a list of all the fallacy names again so you can work with them. But you'll have uh, you'll have 32 example scenarios and you got to pick out which fallacies each of those are guilty of and you'll have um, the answers to compare against so you'll you'll be able to kind of give it a shot right like take some practice exams to get you ready for exam three so it, it's less of a danger blindsiding you um, the reason uh, I want to try to give you as much preparation as possible is because of the timing of exam three there isn't the possibility for a makeup exam here so uh, instead, you're going to have like practice exams ahead of time, and you're going to have two of them. I've got two of them all prepared. So I, I'm very pleased about being able to offer that this quarter to you. Um, when I used it, when I first made them up, I was like, these make tons of sense. They, I think they're very helpful to students. Um, so I'll be modifying that in the, um, the course here too. So stay tuned for that. So I actually just thought, why not just do it now? Actually, I don't have anyone in chat today, so I was like, I'll just pause the recording here. So I got it fixed here in the in the Canvas <clears throat> site, so you can see informal fallacies. Uh, here are here's the informal fallacies homework now, and you can see there are these uh, two uh, documents that have the two practice exams, um, and then you can submit your answers um, and let me know how those go. And I'll be posting the answers up there too. Uh, here so that you've got those accessible to you and you can use them to to study with in preparation for for the final unit here with exam three okay so that's everything that we've got going on makeup exams exam two makeup exams for one and two and exam three those are the really big things that are left that are going to be happening um, through next week um, through this weekend and next week leading up to the very end um, the 18th is the very last day that I can really accept anything because I'm already going to be a madman on, on the 19th getting your final grades turned around. Um, that's already 11th hour. So um, please respect that deadline. It, it can't go any further than that. If you've got concerns about whether you're going to be able to complete everything in time, talk to me sooner rather than later. Um, we don't have a lot of... Um, levers but I'm, I'm always willing to talk about it and see what's going on and if there's anything I can be doing to help make this work for you um, I'm happy to hold that uh, dilemma with you if you if you are having a dilemma about that so please don't be shy there okay um, let's go here all right so moving on here into um, the main thing that I wanted to spend time with you today in this lecture, this is going to be a short one. This isn't going to be our usual like two hour sort of deal. Um, but I thought uh, maybe if someone showed up, <laughs> we could ask questions and stuff too. Um, but I thought I'd just kind of go over the study guide for test two and give you some like last minute tips and, and or reminders about things that we've talked about um, to try to help you set yourself up for success with taking exam two. Um, so here's, uh, just like in my other study guide, there's a list of like all the sort of conceptual material. Um, and then I've got a list here of all the different parts of the exam and what it's going to look like. And I, just like with the first exam, I've got another uh, video. When you when you open up exam two, you'll, you'll get access to a video where I'll walk you through the whole exam and how it's going to work online. But I actually have... Uh, a version of it that this is the version I give to my students when it's um, done in class but redacted <laughs> like all the actual problems are redacted here but you can kind of see the format of how each section of the exam is going to go and what kind of instructions there are so I, th I thought we could kind of run through this together um, to help you get uh, a sense of what you're going to be up against here with exam two so concepts that are important for exam two um, understanding logical validity um, and then 
and just sort of the the mm, conceptual and theoretical uh, foundations for what we're doing with formal logic. Um, you're going to have to know how to translate arguments from English into the symbol language, propositional form. Um, you're going to need to know how to use truth tables for logical operators and to make truth tables for logical expressions to break them down. So you need to know how the logical operators work in order to do this. And then to know how to test arguments for validity using this truth table technique. So you'll be calculating truth tables for individual expressions and then also for full arguments and using um, and then using that truth table to tell if the argument is valid or invalid. Um, then you'll need to know how to recognize and evaluate these different types of arguments, statistical generalizations and applications, inference the best explanation, argument from analogy, and then also um, evaluating uh, evidence for hypotheses about what might be sufficient or necessary for something else, so the SCT, NCT stuff. That's it. So um, this whole list of how the problems are going to look is basically going to show up right here on the exam. So with my redacted version of the exam, uh, we can go through all of these. So let, let's just take a little tour. So you've got some true-false problems again, like before. There, were five, there are five of them here. Um, <clears throat> and then here you're going to have translations of arguments. And you're going to get them in two versions. Um, so... Uh, actually, I, this one I left slightly unredacted. This is this this down here represents just as a reminder that I'm going to be giving you the universe of discourse. So I'm going to tell you what simple propositions each of these letters stands for. So use my translations here uh, in the universe of discourse. All you've got to do is figure out what sorts of logical operators and symbols are needed to get the claims from the argument into their logical symbol form. Um, there are two ways in which this is going to happen. So here's the, down here is the universe of discourse, universe of discourse. But up here is the argument that you need to translate. On these two problems, I'm already putting it into standard form for you. So I've already got the claims broken down. What are the premises? And then there's going to be a line here and what the conclusion is. Um, in fact, is there a, oh, I can't, uh, I can't see it. Um, I'm not going to mess around with that. I don't want to show you what's actually on the exam. But um, there'll be the premises and then a line and then a conclusion, just like standard form that you're familiar with from first exam. So I'll already break that up for you. In this problem, I'm just giving you the whole thing in prose. So you're going to have to pick out what's the conclusion, what are the premises, and then to, to translate them into the logical form. Woo! Um, some tips for remembering what's going on here with translations, or things to be watching out for. Um, when it comes to conditionals, if you uh, remember the sun technique, the sun trick, uh, where you can you you're sort of sensing, yeah, there's a conditional relationship going on. It's one of these like if this then something else, right? That there's some kind of connection between these two states of affairs, but you're not sure which one goes on what side. Like, is it p then q or q then p? Or which one is it? Remember that you can translate the the statement you're trying to translate into logic, first translate it into some equivalent English sentence that uses the language of sufficiency and necessity. And if you can manage that, then you know which things should go on which side, thanks to the Sun Principle. If we're saying A is sufficient for B, then it would look like if A then B. If we're saying A is necessary for B, then we're saying it looks like if B then A, right? If it's in the, well, here, can I draw on the, the uh, uh, uh. <laughs> wait, let me try it again. There we go. No, oh, whoa. There, S, and then, uh, I can't do this backwards, and then a horseshoe, and then an N over here. <laughs> the sufficient condition's got to go in the first spot. And if it's a necessary condition, it goes in the second spot of that horseshoe. Sorry, the, the camera's mirrored. Um, so keep that, that little trick in mind. Uh, if you want to refresh on that, you know, you call me up or something or, or make a comment in the in the discussion thread about the 8, 9, 10 homework here, and we can review that. Um, or I guess that's from Chapter 6. But 
if you want to review any of this stuff, contact me. If you have questions going into the exam, don't just be like, oh, I'll figure it out. Talk to me first. I, I don't mind talking to you at all. I love talking with you. I want to give you all the support I can. Um, if you can use the Sun Principle, don't forget about that. Don't forget about the choice of how to tackle uh, or statements or unless statements, uh, ones that are going to involve the disjunction, the wedge. Are they inclusive or exclusive? Keep that in mind. And keep your eye out for uh, propositional versus non-propositional conjunctions. All of those things are little um, things to keep in mind while you're doing your translations. They may be present, they may not be present, but you, you definitely want to have them on your radar. They're definitely available for you to be tested on in this exam. Um, uh, some of you, I from thinking back to exam one, this is some good general feedback I can give. I saw some people's answers on the exam um, sort of uh, be, uh, what's the best word for this? Um, it seemed like they were trying to game the exam. Like you had expectations about what I was trying to do with the exam and, or what I was looking for and then you like skewed your answers to try to fit what you thought was that like thing I was going to go for and how I designed the exam. And I discourage that kind of thinking. Don't try to game this. Just do everything straight. Use the techniques that you've been taught. When you're asked to do them, do them. Like for translations here, your job is to just get the information from the English into the the uh, propositional form, into the symbolic form. That's it. Don't be like, oh, uh, there needed to be more of this or that or something. Like this especially happened in exam one with annotations. If you're like, oh, there's not enough guarding here. I better mark some more things as guarding. Like don't do that. Don't... Um, don't use expectations here. Just analyze it straight. Maybe something will be missing. Maybe maybe not everything that we went for, that we talked about in the lectures and everything, is going to be represented in the same proportion or something. All right. So don't use those expectations as a way to try to to figure out answers without just using the reasoning that you've been taught with these techniques. Do them straight. That's definitely my advice here. Okay. Um, so those are translations. Again, I'm going to be giving you the universe of discourse, so use those. Then we've got some truth table problems here. And uh, these first two are just going to be single proposition. Oh, oh, that's another thing. Sorry. I knew there was something else I was forgetting. All the translations that you're doing for me, these three problems, are translating full arguments. So that means if your answer takes the form of just a string of symbols here, like say, can I write here? No, it's still going to be redacted. Let's do no color. Okay. So let's say your answer looks like, oh crap, it still is. Can I type now? No, stop. Here. No, it's still redacted. Okay. Uh, here, maybe I can do it up here. All right. So let's say. Your answer takes the form, I don't know, maybe this is problem five or something, but your answer takes the form of um, like not P and Q, then, then R or Q, and then just kind of keeps going like this, like one big long string of symbols. If that's your answer for this problem, this problem, or this problem, you know you've done the wrong thing. Because one string of symbols is only ever representing one claim. And in an argument, there are multiple claims. There's the conclusion, and then however many premises you've got. And each of those premises might be separated from each other. So for all, of, I can just tell you right now, the answers for all of these are going to look like a standard form with symbolic notation where you've got multiple lines of, of strings of symbols, right? One string of symbols for the conclusion claim, another one for a premise, another one for a different premise, that kind of thing. I, it seems like no matter how many times I have emphasized this in the lectures, students, I always have a couple people on the exam here for exam two that uh, didn't kind of get that memo. So I wanted to uh, remind you about it here now uh, as you're preparing to take exam two. Okay, so then on to truth tables, what you're going to be asked to do for these truth tables. Um, so, uh, um, you're going to first be asked to give truth tables for single 
uh, strings, a single complex proposition, so one string of symbols. Um, so you'll have just one column, right? Actually, here, let's pull up our whiteboard again. Um, let's pull up our whiteboard. You know, you're going to have an answer that's going to take this kind of form, where you're going to have over here the symbol for whatever the problem is. And then you're going to have to figure out how many different propositional letters it has. I promise that you deal with two or three. Three is the most, though. Um, so then you'd want to set up you know, the columns for all these different possibilities. All right, and you'll do that the way you've seen in many videos I've already done. And then you'll fill out the truth values for that particular expression, whatever it is. Um, and then this whole chart is your answer. That's your answer for for um, for these problems. For these two, you're going to be getting arguments. And so with, I've got two of them for each, right? So one of them is going to have two propositional letters. The other one's going to have three. This argument's going to have two propositional letters. This one's going to have three. Um, but you're going to be given a full argument here. And then with a full argument, then you're going to have multiple columns for however many claims are in that argument, right? Um, so you'll have to deal with that. Um, and also with these two, you have to tell me about whether they're valid or not after you've got the truth table completed. So your answer is going to be the completed truth table, the exhaustively presented truth table, plus a statement about whether you think the argument is valid or invalid. And that's it. That's all you're being asked to do for those. Moving on to SCT, NCT. So let's see, yeah, no one's shown up in the chat yet. Um, moving on to SCT, NCT, you're, like we talked about in a previous lecture, you're going to be given two versions of how to do this. In the first set, um, I'm asking you for first, which features fail the NCT for feature G, that's the target feature, um, and then also if if they do fail, what are the cases that rule them out? What are the counterexample cases? So maybe you're like, B fails the NCT for G in case 1 and 3 or whatever it is. I don't know. What the, I can't actually remember what these are. <laughs> so don't take that as any indication of the answer. Um, but that's the uh, that's what I'd ask you to do there. So I want to know which things fail. The, just like doing these problems on the uh, homework, You've got A, B, C, D, and then you have G. So the candidates are A, B, C, and D. Those are the ones you have to deal with. Um, then uh, I need to know separately which features fail the SCT for feature G and what are the cases that rule them out. So with 13 and 14, the A, B, C, D, G problems, I'm asking you for what fails the SCT and what fails the NCT and what cases prove that. What are the counterexamples that prove that they fail, that cause them to fail? In 15, it's different. Uh, this one's going to be more like the word problem, so like the dinner where some of my guests died or the homework problem you had to do about the computers failing in the office. Um, you're going to get a bunch of continuums of variables here, and you've got a target condition. The target condition here is dancing. This is a, a DJ set. Uh, like a DJ is trying to figure out of all the gigs that she works like what are the features that get people to dance you know what are the necessary and sufficient conditions for dancing and so she collects all the data from different uh, events that she was a DJ for and then uh, looked at their variables of so the conditions and those are all the candidate conditions and let's see can I actually make some of these visible yeah there we go okay I don't mind showing these to you um, because they're not going to ruin anything for about the problem. Okay, so hopefully I'm not going to screw this up. Oh yeah, there, I'm sorry, there's another thing here. Oh yeah, that's right, okay, I remember this. All right, so the time will be either day or night, um, the public or private setting, uh, what kind of music happened, whether alcohol was served or not, and then whether people were dancing or not. Um, so all of the different variables that could be showing up here are candidate conditions, day or night, public, private, 
etc etc um, I go over this again in the video uh, going through the exam but the key thing here is that here you need to tell me instead of which things fail like in 13 and 14 here you're trying to figure out which things pass and that's all you need to tell me just which things pass the SCT and which things pass the NCT for the target condition of dancing that's it what you have to do to do 13, 14, and 15 is basically the same in principle. Remember, for, for running SCT, NCT, you're just like, are there counterexamples or not? And um, and if there is a counterexample, then it fails. If there are no counterexamples, then it passes. That's all you have to do. But I wanted to ask it both ways just to make sure that you really understand how those tests work. Um, so I'm, it, it's basically the same kind of activity, but I'm just asking for a different side of the answer. Okay. Um, so those are those. And now we get into all the inductive argument stuff. And this is, this is where things, uh, there's more to say, and, and maybe I can be of more help here. Um, with statistical generalizations and applications, as I mentioned in the lecture, I'm going to be asking you a few questions about these. So there's four problems here, and I'm mixing all the generalizations and applications up. So the first thing you have to tell me in your answers is, what kind is it? And like I promised before, I'm going to give you all the standards. They're all right here. Here are the standards for how we'd evaluate a statistical generalization. Here's the standards we use for how to evaluate a statistical application. Based on what type you think it is, you should be using the criteria. So if you think uh, that, that fits to that type. So if you think it's a statistical generalization, you should be using this standard, this set of standards for the evaluation. That's what I'm asking for in D. Are they strong or weak and why? And use the criteria to explain why. So you'll want to address every single one of these standards. If it's a generalization, you'll use these. If it's an application, you'll use these. I occasionally, or almost at least one person, almost every quarter, um, gives me both. And that's wrong. Um, you don't use the standards for an application in evaluating a generalization. And you don't use the standards of a generalization in evaluating an application. Um, it is very important to make sure that you identify which one's which so that you're using the right standard. Everything else can go off the rails. But using that shotgun strategy as a way to hedge your bets, I'm not going to look too fondly on uh, when I'm assigning partial credit. Um, so remember again, the way to test whether something is a statistical application or a generalization. Or actually, before I do that, let's talk about the next two questions that are asked here. I'm going to ask you to tell me what is the reference class and what is the sample slash subset. Remember, we had two names for what's functionally the same thing, depending on whether it's a generalization or an application. So that's how you're going to, identifying those is really how you're going to be able to figure out if it's an application or a generalization. Because in both of them, you're going to have a reference class, which is just a set of things um, that are in a kind of category. And then you're going to have a sample or a subset, which is just the smaller category of things that is in this larger category of things. Um, in both applications and generalizations, there are claims being made about what's going on with these classes of things. There's some property in question here. In a generalization, it's the claim about the smaller category that's used as a premise for drawing a conclusion about the larger category. And in an application, it goes the other way. And this is really the deciding difference. So here's for a generalization, and here's for an application. Okay? If I'm using the claim about the larger category as the premise for a conclusion about the smaller category, that's the application. Okay? So this is the thing to be thinking about when you're trying to answer these questions. It might be helpful to answer questions B and C first, and then go after A to identify whether it's a generalization or an application. Okay, another big thing that I wanted to be sure to remind everyone about in this kind of review preparing for exam is um, how important it is to explain your answers. When you get to A, B, and C are really quick ones, right? You just put it in there. Statistical generalization, reference class is this, sample is this. But D is the one that's going to be like, 
big old paragraph explaining your evaluation using these criteria and you have to address every single one of them if you're doing a generalization and you only talk about these two and you don't talk about these two well there's not gonna be a lot of partial credit in it for you and this is this is the big idea that I wanted to remind you of and I think I might have mentioned this in my last video too but um, when you when I'm grading your work on these exams I'm not thinking about you start with full credit I'm thinking and then and then it'd be like a thing where I look at your answers and see if there's justification for me to take credit away from you rather when I'm grading these exams I start with the assumption that you have zero points so you you don't start with a score of a hundred percent you start with a score of zero percent and as you give answers you're giving me excuses to award you credit so I need those excuses so give me them don't try to game it by being conservative with your explanations in fear of saying the wrong thing or or giving me an excuse to take points away rather you really do need to to make sure you give me plenty of evidence um, to get a window into what your understanding of these things are if you give really vague kg kinds of answers I'll just be like there isn't evidence here that the student knows what they're talking about so I give zero credit for that and that's re that's really how I'm gonna be grading this you're, you're gonna have to earn it basically you have to prove to me that you know what sample bias is all about you have to prove to me that you know what you need to be thinking about to in worries about bias and interpretation regardless of whether you think it's present or not um, if there is bias or not bias you're gonna have to explain your thinking about it either way um, it bring up all the background assumptions you need to um, a lot of this exam uh, the evaluating inductive arguments means thinking outside of just what you're given in the problem you have to uh, keep your brain turned on it's not a mechanical exercise I've said these things before um, it's gonna require you to think about everything that you know about the world and apply that knowledge using the patterns of these these criteria to fit with the problems you're being given to analyze um, if you have questions about this if you're still not sure what the sort of expectations are for good answers of this type especially after looking at my homework answers for 8 9 10 contact me let's talk about it I don't want you going in there being like well I'm, let's see how this goes I mean I, I want you to go into the exam confident that you know what's going to be asked of you you know where the bar is set and you know how to get there and if you don't feel that way um, let me help you get to a place of feeling that way about it which by the way um, sorry I'm skipping around a little bit here but um, I didn't have a lot of people contact me about formal logic so either that's going really well and no one needed my help or uh, people are still not feeling very confident about it and just haven't contacted me um, I'm used to this being pretty tricky for, for that there are always some students where it's like ah, I'm just not getting this formal logic stuff for some reason um, and that w we work on it and then we're able to get to a, a good place of comfort with it so if that's still going on for you let me know and we can do something about it um, okay uh, what other tips do I have here oh yes another reminder oh yeah I haven't mentioned this one yet this this little tip but you notice the standard for an application here says what are the percentages or their equivalent cited in the premises um, this language sometimes students interpret this too literally they just say it was this percent okay this is a criteria of evaluation so you gotta tell me what's good or bad here and to let the answer let the cat out of the bag here the answer is as simple as if that percentage is close to a hundred or to zero then it's strong the closer it is to 50 50 50 percent the weaker it is so you'll you just have to say something in your answer of how you're explaining your evaluation on this criteria to indicate to me that you realize that that's what the standard is I didn't want to word this in any more robust way because it just like gives away the whole game <laughs> so keep that in mind remember why we care to identify what that percentage is but uh, what you really ask to do is also comment on whether that makes the argument stronger or weaker okay so that's a that's a good tip uh, since we're here when you're talking about if the reference class chosen is the most relevant for evaluating the property in question in the subset remember that there's lots of other possible reference classes that could have been chosen instead 
and you need to use your your background knowledge your background assumptions about the world to think about what other candidates might have been better or or if the one that was chosen really is the best um, that's what you'll have to get into there so again thinking outside the box is going to be thinking outside of just the details of what you're given in the problem to be analyzed is a part of the game here um, another reminder here uh, as I alluded to a bunches of times when we've talked about this um, with generalizations the kind of short problems that you get here doesn't give you all the facts of the scenario um, and in particular you you're probably not going to be given the kind of facts that would make for a smoking gun kind of situation for bias in investigation and bias in interpretation um, very similar to if you remember me talking through the Siamese cat problem uh, in the lecture when we talked about this um, but you even in those situations where you don't have a smoking gun you can still uh, talk about what could be the case oh I'm sorry the the Siamese cat one was for argument from analogy sorry but it's a very similar situation where you maybe don't have all the facts that you would want in this situation this is more like the Kmart one that we talked about when Kmart's asking its shoppers if they prefer Kmart to Walmart you don't really know how they did this study or how they interpreted the results of it like what the surveys said or anything like that um, but even with that limited information you can still talk about where you might have suspicion where there would be the possibility of bias in investigation or bias in interpretation so make sure that you give me something on these again um, I'm looking for excuses to give you points and you need to give me those excuses I need your answer needs to be able to demonstrate to me that you know what bias and interpretation is talking about and how you go about figuring out if it's happening or not in a problem that should be evident based on how you explain your answer so um, I hope I'm not well I hope I'm scaring you a little bit I hope I hope that I'm scaring you enough that you respect this part of the question right here recognizing that this is not going to be just a like quick little one-off thing but you're you're gonna have to give me a solid paragraph of explanation here don't skimp on the explanation same thing happens for these last two problems um, I'm gonna tell you which one is which here the IBE and the AFA the inference the best explanation and the argument from analogy again I give you all the standards that you need to be evaluating for for both types um, I'm going to tell you which one is which. So actually, let's see, can I... This part right here. There we go. Yeah, I knew I did it. This part right here. Beep. So I tell you which one's which. This one's inference the best explanation. This one's argument from analogy. So no surprises there. I'm not trying to get cute here with you. Um, but I give you the problem. And then you just have to run through the evaluation. And that's it. And notice how many points these are. They're big chunks of points. This is 24. This is a quarter of the whole exam on these two problems. So don't skimp on that explanation. Um, especially inference the best explanation. You're going to have to address each of these standards one at a time. Uh, and this goes for argument from analogy too. Don't mix them up with each other. Maybe separate them out very distinctly. You might even put different paragraphs. I mean, really. Uh, try to make your understanding of these criteria as explicit as you possibly can to me so that I can be comfortable giving you full credit for it um, like I said before giving sort of cagey answers or incomplete answers or vague gestures at things is not going to get you much much credit at all um, the onus is really on you um, another little side note I kept this unredacted here with the IBE one <laughs> I chose um, a very kind of quick example not one that gives you a ton of of the background um, but I think regardless of you not having more details about the situation you've got everything you need to be able to speak to the various criteria if you're feeling like you need more information to be able to evaluate one of these things that might be a clue that you're maybe approaching the problem in the wrong way or approaching that standard in the wrong way um, so you can kind of trust me here that even though you're not given a lot of information you really do have everything that you need to talk about each of these things um, I'm, I'm somewhat um, pleased uh, the problem I've come up with here because um, it's hard to design a problem that allows 
us to test each of these seven criteria in a like robust way in a way that's like really clear cut like maybe you notice from some of the homework problems that like some of the homework examples are sort of geared for some of these standards more than others like they're trying to like slap you in the face a little bit more with depth versus modesty or conservativeness for example uh, but the problem I've come up with here I think there are interesting things to say about all of these standards with respect to this problem so you can trust that trust uh, trust that it's there to be found if you're having trouble finding it or wishing like oh if I had this information then that would answer it that might mean that the, the your understanding of the criteria is not quite on the money because you should have everything that you need um, when I say assume a standard context that it'd be reasonable to expect I'm saying really don't try to interpret the utterance that's given here in some kind of super wacky way that uh, is like a, a rare sort of abnormal anomalous kind of scenario um, it's kept pretty basic because it would apply to a lot of different contexts um, so I'm gonna blow my nose I keep having this itchy nose I'll be right back. oh that's better okay and then I in the last lecture that I, I talked about 8 9 10 stuff I think yeah that was on Tuesday uh, I mentioned how the problem here for argument from analogy I've already told you about what it's going to be about it's it's gonna involve the subject matter of marijuana consumption so if you uh, I mean both of these problems are gonna draw on your background assumptions and um, we might not have the same whether it's about marijuana use or the topic well I'll just tell you right now the topic that this is going to concern are romantic relationships so we all have different background assumptions about that I'm not going to be grading you on your background assumptions like I said in the last lecture if you've got stereotypical background assumptions about marijuana use that's fine that's not going to stop you from getting full credit I'm not grading you on the veracity or truthfulness or accuracy of your background assumptions but rather how you use them and that's again why connecting the dots in your explanation giving as robust of an explanation of your answers as possible allows me to award you credit even if I think your background assumptions are faulty even if we had different background assumptions um, I try to I'm trying to choose stuff here that's a little bit more accessible and like everyone's got some knowledge about um, it doesn't require as much of specialized knowledge uh, but that's that's the key here because there's no guarantee that you and I look at the world in the same way but we can be using the same criteria here uh, we, we can have the same understanding of what it means for an explanation to be modest for example or that the cited similarities are important what that means like what we're looking for even if our way of wielding those tools and applying those standards uh, ends up going in different directions because of those differences in background assumptions we're, we're still maybe both competently using the analytic technique we just disagree and that happens right reasonable rational informed people can disagree about stuff and that's rational controversy for you uh, okay so that's a little overview of what kind of stuff is going to be showing up on the exam here what you're going to be asked to do uh, there's the study guide again I, I go through the basic same basic thing here um, and hopefully you've got a really good picture and vision for for what this exam is going to look like and um, if you don't let me know because I, I, I don't want exams to be surprises I don't want them to I don't try to have trick problems in there or throw you for a loop um, I try to give you problems that are not obvious <laughs> you know that take a little bit of thinking um, but if you know if you understand the techniques and you understand the the material uh, you should be able to uh, give really good answers here you should be able to sort out and solve the puzzles that I've, I've presented in the exam um, so if you're if you're not sure about what's going on definitely uh, talk to me about that um, let's see so no one did end up showing up my my old standby Neil's not here um, to, that I can count on for asking questions about things but uh, don't be shy about uh, posting things on the 8 9 10 uh, discussion thread and uh, letting me know um, reaching out personally sending me texts calling me emails whatever whatever it takes whatever works for you as a medium for getting in contact with me if there's anything you're nervous about with this exam coming up or 
you're unsure about what the expectations will be, I want to have those clarified for you as much as I possibly can. And there will be another makeup exam for exam two. So that'll happen as well. As I said earlier, I will be, I promise to be trying to turn those around as fast as I can, which is all the more reason why the deadline for exam two, uh, which I think is the 12th, um, has to be respected. Um, I can't, I can't allow for late exams there so that I can turn it around for everybody else and we can have the, uh, some time left here for a makeup, makeup opportunity. Okay. Be in touch. Uh, good luck with everything. I hope you find my new plan for the last week of the quarter uh, acceptable and uh, also maybe excellent. Uh, it's going to fit to your needs and your situation. Um, but I, as soon as I had that idea this morning, I was like, oh, that's a so much better idea than what I had originally planned. So I, I hope that is going to be a uh, service to you. And let me know if it isn't for some reason. But um, yeah. Okay. Oh, uh, code word. This is going to be a short video lecture, but it's still about an hour, so we'll give it half credit. Uh, what am I going to do for code word? Mm -hmm. Okay, because it's just so important to exam two. This is kind of cheesy, but I'm going to have the code word or code phrase this time be robust explanation because that is the most important thing to be shooting for with your answers on the exam when it comes to those inductive arguments robust explanation that's going to be the key okay good luck everyone i'll see you well i'm not going to see you live anymore except for maybe uh, oh yeah i was going to do a an 8 9 10 video and um i'll do a message board for informal fallacy homework too if you got questions about that so maybe you will see me again a couple more times here uh, but otherwise, the rest of the lectures are canned. Um, but uh, yeah, I look forward to hearing from you. Hopefully, I'll, we'll talk more directly and um, helping you through navigating the very end of the quarter here. Good luck with everything.